Hey, Lise Pickett here with The Urban Harvest, and today I am super excited. Um, we are going to be doing a farm tour here with Chris and Amy of Culture's uh, Good Earth Farm here in Kentucky. And they're gonna show us a little bit about what they have going on on their small scale commercial farm. Chris and Amy, tell me a little bit about what brought you guys here, or what started the farm, and, and got you passionate about growing food. Okay. Well, we, uh, we, I grew up on this farm and we were a traditional beef cattle and tobacco farm. And then in my 20s, we transitioned that to vegetables. And Amy came along 20 years ago with me. We got married, so we've been selling vegetables since then. Uh, we have sort of transitioned the farm into a middle-sized diversified farm uh, using a lot of sustainable and organic practices in order to produce good produce, uh, vegetables, fruit, we also do livestock and eggs and chickens. So a really diversified operation. The Good Earth Farm is located in growing zone six. So that means they do get some cold weather. Chris and Amy use a greenhouse and high tunnels to extend their harvest window, but they also make good use of the space year round. This is our uh, production greenhouse. So this is where our um, growing season starts every year. We generally start seeding in this greenhouse in February. Uh, it is a the, the north and west walls are insulated. We actually have a water bank against the northwest walls. So that acts as a heat sink. So it's a very efficient. We have double layer poly on the top and it's a wood frame. So it takes very little heat. Uh, so this is where we start our transplants. We grow transplants through April or May, and then they come out, go into the field. And then it is a multi-purpose uh, building. So this time of year, if you want to look inside, we've got uh, drying garlic and onions and shallots and some of our seeds are being dried in here. So it's a drying house this time of year in the summertime and then we'll shake off it and plant a very late crop of tomatoes or cucumbers in here and that residual heat brings us through November, December so we can normally have tomatoes or whatever we have in containers in here with very little heat up till Christmas. Unheated plastic on a high panel like this gives us about a month at the beginning of the season early and maybe a month to six weeks on the end. So with just this low technology, um, it just really adds to our growing season and really makes a, a better product because tomatoes, most tomato leaf, leaf diseases, as you know, are from rain and moisture. And this really keeps the rain off. As gardeners in the South, we often worry about our leafy greens bolting. Chris, however, explains that choosing bolt prone varieties can actually be a good thing if you're focusing on seed collection or microgreen production. But this is a smooth leaf uh, German kale, and it, it, um, it really is a seed producer. You can spring plant this, it will bolt immediately, so it's not good for kale production, but it's great for seed production. It produces a bunch of seed, and this is a great uh, microgreen seed. So you can do this seed, save it the same year, and then we use this in our microgreen mix. Not all seeds are started in the greenhouse. Many of the fall crops are started outdoors. Here we have the uh, fall and winter coal crops, which is a little bit tough because we have to start them in the middle of summer. It's 95 today, or probably gonna be 97. So they don't like that uh, intense heat. They're a cool season crop. So we do have to do some partial shading for our production here. And then um, it's generally when it means irrigation when we put them in the field. They're gonna go out in August and that's some of our driest, hottest months in Kentucky. So we do have to probably plan on irrigating these unless we get a few uh, windfall rains. In addition to salad greens and annual vegetables, the Good Earth Farm also has thoughtfully planted an orchard of fruit trees. Every, every region is different. We're zone six in the middle of Kentucky. Uh, that's different than it's going to be in the north, in Michigan, or out west, or in the south. So uh, the ones that did good, uh, we didn't do we did minimal spring, so whatever survives, survives. And the ones that survive and produce good fruit, those are the ones we keep. Uh, it's sort of a sad thing that if you go to buy, even in our region, you go to buy an apple tree, your only choices are Red Delicious, Yellow Delicious, Granny Smith, maybe even Honeycrisp, which is a northern apple bred for northern Minnesota, really cold winters. Those apples will not taste good. They will not color up and they will not do well here. I can show you a Honeycrisp tree that we planted as a trial and it's never had any apples on it. So you want to plant uh, trees and varieties specific to your region and you may have to kind of investigate Know what those are. So how do you find species or varieties that do well in your area? I think the best thing is to try to find a regional nursery and there are more and more regional nurseries where you can ask them specifically. You know, in the region being you know a few hundred miles. It's not it doesn't have to be next door. We got some of them of our apples from a southern a southern apple orchard 
and uh, this apple this apple orchard specializes in southern varieties that were developed in the south. If these apples were bred for this region, then they're going to do good here. So we've moved into a lot of the limber twigs. Uh, Virginia Beauty is a good one. These are old southern apples that have been grown as an heirloom for hundreds of years, and they still do well in this region. They've served. Arkansas Black is probably our favorite uh, that we grow here on the farm. It's pest resistant. Uh, light resistance, scab resistance. The Good Earth Farm also cultivates and preserves heirloom seeds from plants that their family has enjoyed for years. This is, you will not buy this one anywhere else. This is called a poly bean. This is a family heirloom. So Aww. it's not available anywhere else. That's so. beautiful. Because it is a really good variety for us. It's very productive. It's a, it's a green bean if you like a bean. Um, and it has a string, and so that doesn't sell very well because people don't like the string bean. As far as taste, uh, excellent taste, excellent taste on these. Sometimes we're used to now in the grocery store everything being convenience. It's so it's it's marketed for shelf life or it's it's grown for stringless. But then we lose other things in the process like flavor or well adaptability to the growing yeah. conditions. So what is heirloom seed saving? Heirloom seed saving is a seed that's going to come back true every year. Um, there's going to be some genetic variation. Uh, you can select those variations if you want them, but it's a seed that's going to come back and then you can continue to save the seed yourself and get a reasonable expectation of what that, that vegetable is going to look like. And these are varieties that have been saved because of maybe they do well in this specific region. So heirlooms are often regional varieties. So those are the ones you want to look for that are adapted to your local regions. Like this bean, this is a, this does really well here. You can see it's a healthy vine, takes the heat and is very productive every year. So these are, uh, these are, these are varieties we want to save, we want to hold on to. You can't grow all these delicious foods without starting with excellent compost. So I'm really excited. We just found that he does uh, vermicomposting as well, and he uses the system that I use. It's a tub. It, it's a beautiful system, and it works so well. So um, what do you use your vermicompost for on the farm? Uh, vermicompost, we set aside for those special crops because we can keep this weed free. Uh, our other compost pile, it'll get weed seeds in. If we don't get it hot enough, you're gonna have some weed issues. But everything, there's a rule here, everything that goes in the vermicomposting uh, bin doesn't have any <laughs> weed seeds in it. So we know this is a great quality weed-free compost, so we'll use that for our transplants, you know, things like that. So, so seed that starting, that kind of thing? Seed starting, yeah. Perfect, okay. perfect for seed starting. In addition to making his own natural fertilizer from compost, Chris and Amy have chosen sustainable and herbicide-free methods to prevent weeds between their planting rows. Well, looking at the principle that weeds need sunlight like any other plant to live, then if you block that sunlight, they will eventually die. So we use, for our weed control between our, our plastic mulches, we use this uh, woven ground cover. This is, you might call this landscape fabric, but this is a little bit different. There's different grades, but this allows the, the water through, so you're not blocking the water, uh, but it will kill the plants. So it blocks the light, so the plants cannot grow under it. Uh, this is also reusable. So it's a very cost-effective method. You can buy this by the roll. Uh, it will, um, will last for years and years and years. You put it down in this kind of weather when it's really hot, the plants will die after a week or two. You can move it up and we move it to somewhere else. So and plants aren't the only thing they raise at their Coulter Good Earth Farm. It's a, to have a truly sustainable farm, I think you really have to integrate some kind of livestock in. Maybe not dogs, but <laughs> but chickens, uh, cattle, sheep, some kind of ruminant. So we do chickens for a couple of reasons. Number one, we have eggs from them. They serve a lot of functions. Number one, it's weed control and pest control. They will eat insects. If we have an area that we need to clear, they will clear that area for us, and then they will fertilize. Just have to think, keep food safety in mind. So you want to have three or four months between when the chickens are on the plot and when you replant that plot. We use a electric netting here to protect the chicken. Uh, this keeps all the predators away, which is a very, which is a problem with chickens often. But this has tended to solve that. We have a solar charger, so this is able to be moved uh, all over the farm. We have a, a tractor here that we can move around different parts of the farm, so we can put them where they want. Chickens will eat probably around 20% of their diet just from fresh forage and bugs and stuff, so it saves our feed bill. The farm uses sustainable permaculture practices, even on areas most people would consider their yard. With a no-mow approach, Chris and Amy build soil quality, have easy access to medicinal and culinary herbs, and create a space that is both beautiful to look at and friendly toward beneficial insects. 
said this is your your no mow lawn this is my no mow lawn right this is great for beneficials and on the farm where we depend on pollinators for our food crops this gives them habitat so this attracts pollinators this attracts uh, beneficials so this is this helps us as well so it also cuts down on mowing you know you're not lawns don't produce anything uh, but this produces food for wildlife this produces uh, water savings this produces a lot of benefits to the whole agro ecosystem and it's pretty to look at so we like it for that reason too uh, these are mushroom logs that we cut from the fence rows it has to be removed anyway so we'll inoculate those and get mushrooms for a couple years from them when they're spent there's still some still some wood there so we we'll use them to build up berms to retain moisture and they'll continue to break down here in place wood chips come from the city crews they're going to take them to the landfill intercept those bring them in recycle those reuse that that continue that uh, that's weed control and that's fertility they're just adding on top of the soil sure. how do you get the grass to go away we, in the beginning yeah we initially we use the um, cardboard we just put down layers of cardboard pizza boxes whatever we can find and then if we have the wood chips available just go directly on top of that directly on top of sod uh, these were planted directly on sod uh, and it kills the grass eventually. Um, we have a really small keyhole garden here and he just surprised me. I would have guessed 15, 20 species. He has 40 species growing in 12 yeah. square feet, maybe. Yeah. And it's a beautiful little planter and a beautiful little garden. And on most of these plants we started from seed. So this is really cost effective to start this, this, uh, this herb bed. And all those plants we planted really densely. So that takes care of the weeds. So. And then whichever ones, and plants in nature, if you look at nature, there's no widely spaced plants, right? So they're all crammed together and they're used to that. So you can stick them in there tight, get a lot in here. A lot of these are perennials, so they'll come back next year. And there's a few annuals like marigolds and stuff I added in, uh, but primarily these are medicinal plants. There's some culinary herbs in there as well, but a, a great mix really close to the house. So we can come right out and, and pick what we need for supper. Thank you so much for showing us around, Chris. I truly love seeing your farm and it's always so fun to get to see everybody's different concepts and takes on the same thing, ground food. Um, you guys have a beautiful place here. So um, if anybody who's checking this video out wants to support you or your work, or if they're local or not local, how can they do that? Or how can they find information? Just check our website, coulterfarm.com. And that's all information is on that side, including a link to our book, which is on Amazon. So this is just a book about survival gardening, growing what you need to survive. Uh, feed your family. All right, so I'll put the link um, for that book down below so that you guys can easily find that as well as the link to his website. And thank you so much, Chris. I thank really you, appreciate Elise. it. I've enjoyed it. <laughs> it was a wonderful experience to be able to see how they've integrated permaculture principles, small scale farming, and working with what nature provides. This permaculture farm tour uh, hopefully was entertaining and um, valuable for you. If you did like this video, uh, make sure to comment below and let me know if there's any other topics or tours that you would like to see. And if you would like to see some of my other permaculture tours, make sure to check out this video next.